Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So, hi everyone. Good morning, and for some of you, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here today with me. Uh, as suggested by the title on the screen, we're going to talk about planning visuals for learning, and we'll both get to know some fundamental design principles, guidelines, tips, and tricks to help you prepare visuals for your learners. And I'll provide a lot of examples along the way to help you understand how these principles could be applied for learning content. So, um, and I try to find some examples related to the medical and health field, but as some of you know, I don't really have a background in medical and health, so I might mispronounce some words, you know, here and there. Um, please forgive me. I appreciate, I appreciate your understanding. Okay. So, yeah, I prepared a little background about myself. So, my name is Mingyu Li, or Li Mingyu in Chinese. Uh, we put the last name at the first. I'm originally from China. Um, you can call me Ming. So I came to the US uh, for my Master of Science in Instructional Design and Technology first, and then I came to Virginia Tech to pursue my PhD degree in Instructional Design and Technology. So currently I'm working as a graduate assistant um, in the Instructional Design and Technology Master's degree program, and as mentioned by Dr. Ames, is uh, an asynchronous online program. So what I do is I grade assignments submitted by students enrolled in the course of visual literacy. Um, and also, I will help them walk through the learning content. If they have any questions, they will reach out to me via uh, basically email. So there are a lot to talk about visuals for learning. Uh, also, there are a lot of terms and concepts in this world. So today, for today's webinar, I'm not really trying to like fit all of those into your brain, which is also impossible to be finished, to be accomplished in a 45 minutes to one hour session. So what I'm trying to do really here today is trying to slice a piece of that and we just, we just try to understand that. And that is the fundamental principles and guidelines. So I'm really trying to open the door of the visual world for you. You know, feel free to hop in the car and we'll go on a road trip, road trip to the uh, world of visual. And at the end of this workshop, I hope you will agree with me on the importance um, of visuals for learning and teaching. So then, after this webinar, you will have visuals, you know, keep the visuals in your mind whenever you design anything for learning, for your learners. Even when you write an email, you will not only check the grammar, you know, the grammar of the sentences and the flow of the information as you usually do, you will also check the visual display of it to make sure it does, it facilitates the transmission of messages to your learners instead of you know, having a negative impact on it. So, I've been talking about the term visuals, this concept from the beginning of this session. So what are visuals anyway? Uh, well, there are a lot of definitions of visuals, right? But in the context of today's session only, the visuals, okay. So let's just see this document first. You don't need to read any text on it, so don't read it. Okay, so there are a lot of visual elements on this. Uh, for example, we have what? We have color, we have font, we have layout, which is how the elements are arranged on this frame. We also have white space, and it's called white space, not because the space is white, it's because it's empty. So, and also a lot of other elements. And a lot of people would say these elements, these visual elements are about the look and feel of a design. So let's just call it look and feel for now. But you also have other graphics. For example, these three graphics. So people would say, because this graphics is directly related to the text on this document that describe this image for learning. So they will call these images what instructional graphics. So in the context of this session, we'll call both of, the, of, of this visual. So whenever I mention visual throughout this um, entire session, it means all of this. So do we get, okay? <laughs> all right, so the next question is, so why visuals? Why should we consider visuals when we design learning? Well, there are a lot of reasons I can tell you, but we, we have limited time today. So uh, let's put some research first. Okay, so we know for learning in a digital environment, it is very essential for our learners to do what? To interact with all these different kind of digital devices who have software on them and they have an interface, right? So there is a branch of research 
a lot of research has been done trying to understand this interaction to help the learners interact with the devices. For instance, human-computer interaction research and the user experience research. So according to these scholars, uh, so they have found out that when we interact with these digital interfaces, we have some thoughts. You know, we're not just sitting there, we, we're thinking things. So our thoughts are influenced by the visual aesthetics or the visual experience or the general visual impression that these devices and the interfaces are, you know, providing for, them, for us. And what do we judge on? So we judge the credibility of the content presented on those interfaces only based on visuals. We also judge the usability of a particular software or the entire device. And the visuals also impact our emotional status or affective status in general. So apparently there's a correlation between the visual design of those inter digital interfaces and uh, with our judgments of uh, you know, the credibility, usability, and our emotional status. So that's one of the reasons you know, why visual matters, why we should consider it, especially in the digital environment. So the next one, when it comes to our learning world for educational teaching and learning, so instructional or learning message design is one of the main research branch to study this connection between visual and learning. So we know that there are a lot of different media formats we can use to display our learnings, especially in a digital environment. So for example, we have text, we have images, we have video animation, virtual reality, and we will have a lot of them in the future on like something like we've never heard of. But so in general, according to this branch, branch of research, considerations should, also, should always be given to the visuals to make sure that the planning and the designing and the presentation of learning content are facilitated you know, are facilitating learning um, or the transmission of learning messages from the media to the learners. So that's also, you know, in the learning world, why visual matters. So then coming into the medical world, I'm pretty sure a lot of audience here today know better than me about the importance of these visuals, you know, for our learners to achieve the learning objectives and then for them to practice, you know, medical practices in real life. So. That's why visual matters. So the next question would be, okay, so me, now we know, you know visual matters, but how do we handle visuals? So my experience working with the people who are interested in this topic, but just coming into this topic, you know, who are new to this topic, their first question would be, you know, me, um, I'm not really confident in my ability to handle the visuals myself. You know, I'm not an artist. Well, you know, to tell you what, I'm not an artist either. So because art is different from design you don't need to worry about this so when we think about art you think about self-expression and the attitude of i don't really care about anything but when it comes to design design is for communication and we do care and we care about a lot of things so we're going to talk about design which is on the right side of this slide we're not talking about art so for art you don't really have a specific goal or an audience and the meaning of art is really open for discussion and interpretation. And that's what makes art interesting. But for design, we're designing to achieve a goal. Like for learning, we're designing to help learners to achieve the instructional objectives. And we design for a specific audience. And also, we're trying everything we can to make sure that our learners, to perceive the meanings that we intended as, you know, as the designer behind those visuals. So art is in general free and creative, while design has to follow a certain, you know, certain guidelines, techniques, and principles. And it is those principles that we're going to uh, talk about today. So you don't really need to worry about like, you know, you don't have artistic abilities or something like that. Uh, it's okay. All right. So to, to talk about design, um, I can guarantee you, uh, if you find a design, you, you know, a book for beginners. Um, for the design, uh, pretty much you have these two aspects in the in the book, which are um, principles and elements. So for design elements, design elements are fundamental building blocks of any visual. When we think about, you know, for example, a drawing or a fly or something like that, you will have a lot of elements. For instance, we have dot, we have line, we have shape, we have texture, we have color, we have font. So we have all these different elements. And we can use a lot of words to describe these elements. For instance, 
we have, you know, we have the attributes or features to describe uh, a certain instance of an, uh, of an element. For example, we can use a size to describe a shape. We can also use a size to differentiate between a bigger shape and a smaller shape. And for principles, principles are guidelines on manipulating or adjusting the elements and their attributes or feature, of course, for a specific audience and for a purpose. You don't just randomly go in to you know, manipulate elements without any purpose. We don't do that because this is design. So for principles, today we're going to talk about, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of principles. We're going to focus on four of them today, which are contrast, alignment, reputation, and proximity. And you can use an acronym, CARP, to remember this principle. Of course, you know, some people might say it's, it's crap. Well, whatever works for you, it works. Um, so elements are the fundamental building blocks. But our focus today will be mainly on the principles because the principles are guidelines on the manipulating elements. Uh, I'm not suggesting that elements are not important for uh, e-learning. It's just uh, usually we start from the principles and then we will embed some elements in the principles and when we talk about the principles. And then we will mainly talk about color and font. So this are for, you know, if you're interested in learning more about the topic after the workshop, you can do some studies by yourself. So, okay, so we'll start with the principles. So we have this four, contrast, alignment, repetition, proximity, and we'll start from contrast. So what is contrast? Simply, contrast is difference. And because we're talking about visual today, so the difference is what is visual difference. And how do you achieve the visual difference or to create contrast in a, in a frame, in a design? So we adjust the visual attributes and the features of the visual objects on a design. And this is still you know, very abstract. And let's use some, uh, some examples to understand how do we create visual difference. OK, right now, you should see uh, three circles on the screen, right? They're identical. They are the same color, um, same size, and they're all circles. So what if, you know, to create contrast, what I do, I, you know, manipulate the features of the element. For instance, how about I change the color of one of the circles? Now I have what? I have contrast. I have difference. Okay, so that's I'm, I'm manipulated the color. So what about I manipulate the shape? Now I have a difference here, and that's the shape. And then... What about I add a border, a colored border to one of the circles? Now I have contrast again. So really you have multiple ways to create contrast in a design. So now you, you, know, you know how to create contrast. But the problem becomes like why we need contrast, especially in e-learning. Because of this benefit, and then we'll go through one by one through some examples. So the first one is contrast is attention focusing. Okay, I'm going to click on it. Okay. So now uh, we have this image of the anatomy of the bones of the human hand. So for, let, let's imagine, for a novice learners, you know, for someone who has limited prior knowledge in this topic, when you see this image, it might be overwhelming at first because there are a lot of terms going on and they all look the same. They're all capitalized, they're all black, and they're the same size. So what if, imagine I'm the instructor and I want to direct, my, direct the attention of my students onto a particular term. What I do, I do contrast. I create difference. Let me show you an example. For example, how about I do this? So there are a lot of going on. If I'm going to talk about, okay, phalanxes, phalanxes. So, you know, I just want my students to focus on this term while I'm talking about it as an instructor. So I direct their attention here using contrast. So there's some same examples. So you can use, uh, you know, contrast to direct their attention to the object on the screen that you are talking about as the instructor. Okay, let's see a different example. So th this is a list of symptoms of COVID-19. And as we know now that COVID-19 is very similar to, let's say, a seasonal flu, there are a lot of similar symptoms. But there is one is very unique. And I want to talk about this one. So I don't want my students to just wandering around the screen. So I, how about I do this? I'm adding a background color to make this pop, to make this you know, different from everything else. So by creating contrast, I have the attention of my students. 
So that's using contrast to create attention focus and why you need contrast. The second one is contrast organizes learning content. So I'm going to sh show you some examples. Um, but this is a quick activity. OK, so in a few seconds, I will show you um, a one-page document. And uh, on this one-page document, uh, I want you to tell me how many sections are there or how many topics are there on this one single uh, one-page document. I will give you three seconds to look at the document. OK, are we ready? Yes. Hello? OK, OK, perfect. OK, three seconds. All right, three, two, one, go. OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Excuse me? What's your question again? Yeah, my question was, um, OK, I was going to show you a document, a one page like Word document. Yeah. For, like, three seconds and you only need, you don't need to tell me what content in it Just tell me how many sections or topics are there how many sentences are there how many topics or sections okay i think um i got three sections okay that was quick <laughs> thank you Sharon. perfect okay so I was going to show you some examples to, you know, to contrast it, but yeah, I think it might be difficult to understand. Let me just show you, show you a comparison. I'm, he I'm hearing someone's talking. I can't really see anyone's activity. I can only see my slides. So it might be, it might be a little bit confusing. Okay, so let's see this two, you know, two documents, one page document. So you have one on the left and you have the other one on the right. The only difference between these two are I applied the contrast, you know, to the subtitles. So I was giving you uh, three seconds to look at the left one. So I was trying to demonstrate the effect of contrast to allow learners to immediately identify how the learning content is organized in your document. So you are giving learners what you are making, you know, their, um, their learning very effective. So that's the effect of contrast to organize the learning content. I'm sorry if that was a little bit confusing, but thank you. Okay. Okay, so the next one is contrast enables us to see. How le okay, so let's see some examples. So here I have four slides. So you might tell me that you prefer the two that you prefer are the ones you do. Uh, could you please mute your mic? <laughs> Jing Jing! Yeah, I am doing it. Thank you so much, Jinjin. I know you have kids. They're adorable. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> they are on their uh, headphones, so they are screaming to their classmates. It's okay. I mean, it's COVID-19. It's quarantine. We understand. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's continue. So you might you might tell me like you prefer the slide, the two slides on the left, um, because there's a strong contrast in it. You have a strong contrast between the text and the background. So the two on the right, you can you know you can still see the text if you really try, but it will be really difficult. So this these two examples on the right might be a little bit extreme at this point, but uh, I would suggest you you know going back to any document you have ever prepared for your students and check those documents. Maybe you have some slides that you know just look the, just look like the one on the right. So don't do this. So have the strong contrast between the text and the background. So the next example, is, let's see these two. So we can still see the text clearly because there's a contrast between the text and the background image. But still, there's a problem with this. So what's the problem? So the color of the background are, you know, are extremely bright. So especially you know, for a digital screen, these kind of colors are very difficult on the eyes. So we can still keep the contrast, but maybe use um, you know, a neutral color to make them read easily. Like the one on the left, I still have the blue, but it's easier to read. The one on the right is still you know, on the yellowish side, but it's easier than the one above it. Okay. 
I also have a Google extension I can introduce you about color blindness. Um, but I also save this at the end of the workshop if we have time. Okay, so I ask you guys, I ask you um, to watch a video before this workshop, but it's okay if you have not watched it. It's okay. I'll show two screen captures from that video that's showing, you know, two images. One of them is the before, the other one is the after the application of the contrast. And you can tell me where is the contrast uh, and why do you think this contrast is needed? Do you think it's effective? So these are the two screenshots from the video. The one on the left is the before, the one on the right is the after. Do you see contrast? It's in Japanese, but it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't uh, make it difficult to understand the point here. Do you see contrast? Can someone yeah. ask? Yes. Uh, a specific goal for you. Yes, it's pretty clear. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, so we do see contrast on the right. We see what we see the, you know, we know this language, although we don't, we can't read it, but we know this is a language. So the one, you know, on the top is so much bigger, and they use a bright color, a red, to make a strong contrast to catch your eye. And based on this image, we know this might be dangerous, something like this, right? So that's how contrast can be applied to uh, real life, you know, like a flyers or information sheet or something. Um, so yeah, this is um, the image from the from the video. Okay, so that's all about contrast. And next one, we'll talk about alignment. Okay, so alignment means aligning things to an invisible line. Let's see this is as an example. So imagine this is a one-page document. And I have all these elements. So for example, I have a title, I have a main text, I have an image, and I have a lot of subtitles. So it might be difficult for you to read this document to understand how the content is organized or where should I read first. But right now, I'm going to only change the alignment of it. So now, all of this content, they are aligned to an invisible line or a visible line in your mind which makes it easier to read. So that's alignment. And why we need alignment, we will see more examples to understand this, and we'll see how this example can apply to a lot of, a lot of different kinds of learning content. Um, okay, so a visual connection helps to build a mental connection. So what I mean by this, let's see some exa examples. Okay, so it's the same slides from before. We see this is symptoms. Now we see all of these bulleted points or all of these symptoms are aligned to one invisible line on the left. So this is a visual connection and it helps build a mental model in your mind that's, that these symptoms are, are related. So what if I now change the alignment to this? So now you have two visual connections and in your mind, Although you know, you know, these are all the symptoms of COVID-19. There is no like this one is uh, what is better than the other one or something like, or this one is a sub symptom of this one. But only because I changed the alignment and you see, you know, you see two visual connections. Now your mind is telling, your brain is telling you, now we have two groups, but that's not a fact. So when you do your design, if you don't want learners you know, to perceive the things into two groups or perceive two visual connections when there actually is one, then do alignment, you know, align, them, align them to the same line. And this principle uh, you know, should not only be applied to the text. Let's just see an example with, uh, with a graph. OK, for instance, so I use this you know, chart, this graph, to show you what I mean by visuals at the beginning of this session, right? So I purposefully aligned, for example, these two because they are equivalent here. So the visual, you know, visual is composed of these two. And then this is a third degree, you know, a, thir uh, a, a third level of uh, elements. So what if I change this? Let's, let, let me change. So right now they are aligned to this line. So what if I move it like this? Although, you know, because you are already familiar with this graph, you know they are still the same level. But because I changed the alignment, because I changed the alignment, it just feels like it, it's that the visual connection of it is telling your mind that these two are not on the same level. So that's how alignment can do to your mind. Okay, so the next one is 
appropriate alignment would facilitate reading. Let's see some examples. Okay, you don't need to read the text here. I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, these are two paragraphs, the same paragraph, same text describing coronaviruses. But the difference is the one on the left is aligning to the left. You have this invisible line, everything is here. And the one on the right is aligning to the center, is symmetrical. So, you know, some people will, you know, will wonder like, so what's the difference here? Like why, you know, I can still read the text. I don't see the problem here. Okay, so as an English reader, we now we read English from left to right, from top to bottom. So when you read a text a lot, especially a long text like this, your eyes would move from left to right and then go back to the same point. So your, your eyes would be moving like this. So your brain learned the pattern to read this text. You, uh, you know, your mind is having an expectation that your eyes should always go back to the same position, which would save your time. So the problem with the center align is your eyes moving like that, not like this because you don't know where the start of the next line is. So for, you know, for learners, especially online learners, like they are reading a lot of things on, on screen. You are, let's just, you know, save some brain power for them to just really focus on the learning content instead of focusing on trying to understand how this text is displayed and how they should read the text. So for a long text, I would definitely recommend the one on the left. We should align to the left instead of align to the middle. Okay, but for short text, let's see for example here on this one page document, and again, don't read the text, you don't need to read the text. Okay, so I have these three short titles, and, they, and right now they're aligning to the center, but what if I change it to the left? It doesn't really change you know, my reading habit of this document, so that's okay with the short text to center align, but for a longer text, I'll align them to the left. And this principle does not only apply to, for example, this looks like a Word document. I would suggest you to go, in, you know, go back to check your documents, especially PowerPoint slides, because as, you know, as scholars, as graduate students, as instructors ourselves, we, deal with, uh, you know, we do this document or to follow a standard. For, for example, here in the US, uh, you know, for education, you need to follow APA style. So you are accustomed to this type of alignment. You know in your mind when you do a Word document, okay, I need to align everything you know, according to the standard. But when you're doing slides, PowerPoint slides, there really isn't a standard, you know, a standard for you to follow. So it would be, you know, it would be very easy to ignore these rules. So I would suggest, you know, going back and then check your PowerPoint slides about the alignment. Okay, so the next thing, example is when we deal with, you know, when we're dealing with images and a text. So like this one, in this example, the text and images are aligning to the right. And based on the uh, example I just showed you, you know, this is not easy for readers to read. So maybe someone would suggest, okay, so let me just align the text, you know, to the left. But the problem here is you have all this empty or white space here. And for example, this text describe this image. So when learners learn, you know, when, when they read this text and process the image mentally, they swipe their eyes left and right. And then when they swipe, uh, you know, when they, they move their eyes from the image to the text, they meet the end of the sentence first. So I would suggest that, you know, simply just to put the image on the left, <clears throat> excuse me, and then put the text aligned to the left. <clears throat> All right, so these are some screenshots from the video as well. As you can see, this is the before, and this one is the after. So the after one is aligned to the left, and this one is a receipt. You can see all the prices are aligned to the right. So you can, you know, when you see the total price, you will go ahead and check, like, oh my gosh, what about, <laughs> you know, which one is more expensive than the other one? Maybe next time I won't buy it. So these are the examples from the video. <clears throat> Okay, so that's all about alignment. So next one, we'll talk about reputation. So reputation, you know, by itself is repeating something. So what we are repeating, we are repeating the visual attributes of certain objects in the design. And let's see some examples. Oh, okay, so reputation is similarity, is consistency, and similar to the difference, when we talk about contrast, talk about visual difference, here we're talking about visual similarity. And of course, we're adjusting the visual attributes and the features to create similarity. 
consistency or reputation. So, okay, so you are familiar with this, you know, images. I use this, you know, to demonstrate the principle of the contrast. So right now I have all these images on the same screen. And if I ask you how many groups are there, you know, it, um, it quite possibly for someone who just saw this image, they would group these circles uh, together as what, uh, you know, belonging to the same group because they are visually identical, because they are similar, because the style is repeated. So that's the principle of reputation, which is the visually similar things as a human beings, we are more easily to perceive them to be in the same group. We are more easily to perceive a connection between these images. Although there might be, you know, in, in reality, there might not be any um, actual connection between them, but only because they are visually similar to one another, then our mind is telling us, okay, so they're in the same group. So it's the similar thing. It's a visual connection facilitating mental connection. Let's see an example. Okay, so it's the same document. Right now, I have these three topics or titles of this document. They are the same color, they are the same font, and they are the same size font. So your mind is telling you, okay, so these are equivalent as the subtopics. Now, what if I change one of them to a different color? So right now, although you know they are equivalent because I just told you, but only because I'm changing the similarity of this one, these two are similar it appears that these two are in the same group and somehow this one is different. So you might have a question that, okay, Ming, we were, when we were just talking about contrast, you told us to you know, change the visual attributes to, uh, to create contrast. But here you are telling us to create similarity. So what's going on here? Well, keep in mind. So the audience for learning, the audience, the instructional objectives, the context, and every factor that about learning should determine the principle that you choose to apply to a design. It should always be that the principles serve learning and teaching instead of other way around. So you choose whether you choose contrast or similarity, it all comes down to what are you trying to achieve here as the learning designer. Okay? All right. So similarity. Okay, let's continue with this example. For instance, I have this one page document. What if this is a multi page document, multiple page document? For example, you have you know, the, all the other pages and you don't even need to read the text. Of course, it's not even language. So uh, it's just letters, random letters. So even you don't know the content you know, in, the, in the pages after this the first page, you know how many topics are there because it's consistent, because the style is repeated because there's consistency. All the, you know, all the main texts are in the same format and all the uh, subtopics are in the same format. So it, it, you are really helping learners. Like when, when learners read the first page, they are learning how you as the, you know, as the instructor are presenting the content to them, how this content is organized. So they learn that on the first page and that pattern they learned can be applied to everything after that. So if you are changing how you organize the content on this page, on the other pages, then you are creating troubles for learners to spend more brain powers to focus on those instead of focusing on the learning content. Okay, so for our reputation, so we were just talking about, you know, repeat the font style and the color. So remember the elements, we have the color, we have font. So to create reputation and consistency, you can use a lot of different ways. And you know the easiest, the easiest way is to use color and font. For example, here I have these three color, you know, color circles, and you know well that these colors and the colors I use throughout this entire slide. And for the font, I'm only using this. Uh, this the style is this one only, but I'm using different sizes of it. So speaking of fonts, you have different types of fonts, and so this type you have these little tails. It's called serif. And the other one is the sans serif. So the sun, this is French, it means without. So it doesn't really have a tail. So research showed that this type of font, the one that without the tail, is better to be used for e-learning, especially for smaller fonts. When, when the font is like big as this one, this one is okay, it's easier to read, but for smaller font, for digital environment, this one should be the choice. For print media, this one is better.
Okay, so that's how you can use color and font to create a reputation throughout your entire design. And this is one example from the, um, from the video. You can see um, these are you know, the station names of a uh, substation of Japan somewhere. And the one on the top, you can see you, know, you have four characters here and two characters here. So first of all, they are not aligned. And second of all, they are not repeated. So in the second one, this is the after. You can see they are all aligned to the top, but also they are repeated, which is, so the size of these circles, they are all the same, right? Although there are different characters in some of them, but they're all the same, they are repeated. So it's easier for learn for you know, the people who go into the subway to recognize the pattern or the design of this and to facilitate their traveling. Okay, so that's about reputation. So the next one we're going to talk about is proximity. So let's use, uh, still use some examples to understand what proximity is. Okay, the same image. Okay, we just talked about when we have this image on screen, we're easily grouping the visually similar uh, images together because of reputation. So what if now I'm changing the position of them? I'm changing the position, you know, I put these three close to one another and these close to one another. Now you are seeing this group as a group and seeing this as a group. So even these circles are still the same, but because of their proximity changed, now your mind is telling you this is a group, this is a group. So proximity is we need to place related items close to one another. So when learners see the design, they will know that the items are placed together, has a connect, have a connection in them. So when it comes to e-learning, this principle, principle of proximity, is often used to deal with images and a text, which means you need to, uh, you need to place the uh, text next to the image that this text describes. Let's see some examples. It facilitates cognitive processing and avoids, dis avoids distractions. Okay, so we see this document about COVID-19 and you don't need to read the text, I'll just explain this. So, you know, when we, when we first saw this, in, uh, first saw, saw this, uh, see this document, you might be wondering, okay, I don't see any problem with it. You know, it's very clean. Uh, I see contrast. Uh, I see contrast between this and this. I see reputation, so I don't see a problem with it. Well, let me change it a little bit. What about this? You see the difference? So, the after one is the, you know, applied pro uh, the principle of proximity. So, in the before one, Yes, it looks nice, but the problem is the learners need to, for example, because this is step one, this block of text describes the first image. So they need to read this and then go back to the image. Okay, it might be easy for them to read the first one because they are close to one another, each other. But what about the second one? They need to, you know, move around the document to find the image. You are adding extra, you know, uh, labor for them to finish. But in the second one, with the proximity, the image is placed right next to the text it described. So their eyes just moving like this. So it's easier for them to build a mental model and to learn the content, to you know, use all of their brain power to understand the content instead of finding the images. Okay, let's see a different one. Let's see if this is two page Word document and you don't need to read the text. Okay, so this paragraph about nerve, like this entire paragraph and here, it describes this image. And this happened a lot. So if you prepare something like this for a students, imagine, you know, in the, uh, for digital learning, they are using, for example, a laptop to view this document. What they need to do is they need to screw up and down, up and down, up and down to process this paragraph while understand this image to find the image information to matching the text. And imagine they are using a mobile device. Let's see a phone. It will be even harder for them to find the content that they needed. So how about this? Let me change it a little bit. Let me apply the principle of proximity. So I'm using the image, I'm placing the image right next to the text it describes, although there are some a portion of the text on the second page, but the majority of the text is still on the same page with the image. 
and see, let's see the first sentence. There are three main nerves supplying the hand. So from right beginning, from the first sentence, they read this text and go back to the image. But this would be very difficult to achieve when you have this type of, um, you know, without proximity. So that's how proximity can, can be applied to a Word document. Okay, so these are two screen captures from the video. Um, this is a trash can, apparently, and these are the signs. And so the first text is burnable, and the blue text is non-burnable. So in the first one, we can see, okay, they are, you know, they are very organized. But on the second one, we see the problem. So all the burnables are now placed close or in close proximity to the text it describes. So it, you can immediately, immediately tell, like, these are in the same group, and you can recognize the trash there. But this one, you need to find the red ones to match the text. So this is the principle of uh, proximity. Okay, so we just uh, talked about all four principles. And um, I still have some slides here, and we're already 40 minutes in. So I think it might be good to, you know, to answer some questions if you have any. So um, I have a question, Ming. Yeah. Um, so I know at the beginning you kind of stressed that you don't have to be an artist or design, and I feel like you just kind of gave some examples on how we could, um, even if someone else is helping us with our designs, we could recognize pretty quickly if we don't like this setup for our students. And um, so I wouldn't even have to, you know, do it myself, right? I could just say, hey, can we move this to this page or can we get these things closer together? Is that kind of um, uh, the, how I should be taking this? Yeah, of course. Uh, I, love, I love this angle. So yeah, well, you know, in reality, like right now, we're uh, in this audience, we have a lot of instructors, faculty members, we have a lot of instructional designers, we have graduate uh, students in the IDT program. So yeah, I do agree with you. Uh, well, see like here in Virginia, at uh, Virginia Tech, uh, you know, in the e-learning department of Virginia Tech, they have a dedicated person for graphic design. But there are also a lot of, you know, it's very common for an institution um, to, you know, not having this type of person. So this knowledge will really help you to clean up or make your document really organized to facilitate learning. Even at Virginia Tech, when you do have this dedicated person to help you with the visual design, you have the words, you have the concept, you have the mind map to understand what's going on. For example, if they you know, submit a, doc a design to you, you know how to evaluate, you know how to review the document and spot the problem. And then you have the terms and the concepts to describe, yeah, of course, to describe to them, to communicate to them what is the thing that I want. So, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I have a question, Ming. Um, I was curious if you have had, uh, you know, much experience with learning management systems. You know, I, I don't know if, you know, you, you guys are still using Sakai or what, what you're using, but um, have, do you find that uh, it's easy to sort of translate some of these principles into the learning management spaces that as they're created, you know, as they're designed or, or do you mostly think about creating these things, using these principles sort of before they're loaded into these systems, you know, or do you, I don't you know, do you know what I'm saying? Like, do you, you yeah. kind of consider, okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I think that's a great question. So here at Virginia Tech, we work with Canvas. And in Canvas, um, if you know you have rich content editor, I would definitely suggest that before you load everything into Canvas, you better have, for example, just a simple layout. You know, for instance, um, OK, I better just, uh, let me just show you Canvas. Okay. You should be able to see 
my Virginia Tech canvas. Okay, so for instance, you have pages in Canvas, and you can add pages, and here you have an editor. So I would suggest, you know, for example, just uh, have some basic plan before you put the content in the Canvas, like where should you place the images and the text. And also, you know, the Canvas size is different from a Word document or a slide. So like for a Word document, um, I think you can just place here uh, in Canvas. But for a slide, actually, you have different ways to display slides. Um, uh, in Canvas, for instance, I have here, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to leave, uh, okay, test page. For instance, this is a PowerPoint slide. So see, okay, I have these buttons to just switch around. So in this case, if you have a PowerPoint slide, I think I can do this. I can, you know, pre-design in a slide and then load it into Canvas, and it will keep its format. Does this answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much, Mick. Thank you. Thank you for this question. <clears throat> um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I have to turn on my camera. So I'm reading a book. Okay. Yeah. Are, can you see this? This one? From point of the visual okay. literacy, this one? Okay. And this one, can you see that? Yeah. So the difference is here, um, the author is arguing about the cognitive load. Mm -hmm. But from the point of the visual literacy, do you, which one do you think it's more friendly for the readers, the first one or the second one? Well, you know, uh, I need to read the text. <laughs> <laughs> the text is in the heart. Hard. Hard. The, blood flew. the blood flew in the heart. The first one is more like the picture on the above and the text on the bottom. And the in the bottom. Yeah. And the second one is like the explanations. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine flows, and the texture is just next to the numbers. So mm -hmm. the picture. So from the point of <clears throat> Visual literacy, I I think I prefer prefer the first one, but from the point of the cognitive no theory, kind of the also prefer the second one. Okay. Okay. So here is the, the question. Well, how to balance? Yeah. Okay, I like your question and I like your critical thinking about this. So I don't um you know I don't clearly I don't really know the situation there, but I would say there are of course there are a lot of factors playing in this, like as you should suggest that their visual design, their cognitive processing, like the second one is placing text next to the visual is it described. Okay, so I would say this. Let's see, for example, if this image right now, you this image is a printed image, right? You can't really like use fingers to resize like on the a digital screen. What if it is a digital screen? If it's a digital screen, you can, you know, you can zoom in to focus on one of them and zoom out to you know, view the entire as an overview. So in the media, the second format you said you prefer, um, sorry, I forgot, but the second one I see from my point of view, like just now you showed the page to me, the tags are extremely small you know, it's extremely small. So I don't know how it would read in real person, but I would say that my point is there are a lot of factors playing in this. And I would suggest, that, for example, if you are the designer, then maybe you should prepare this image in, you know, to all those different formats. Like the one is with, uh, you know, the text in the outside of the image. The second one is text inside the image. And maybe the third one is a digital alternative to you provide for the students. And then it might put yourself in the shoes of the learners and see which one would work for you. And of course, it also depends on the context, which, which is why I said, you know, factors. If it's a digital environment, of course, you are doing that. And if it's a printed media, okay, which one? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I got your point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? I think Rebecca asked a question in the chat. Can you see the chat? I can just ask it. And uh, oh, okay. I, was, I, was, I was being lazy. You know. <laughs> um, so Ming, one of my questions was, and I think you already answered it, this idea that if you have no experience with this and you're putting up visuals for the first time, 
you learn these things. So I guess it's just trial and error as you go. You kind of develop that experience as you go, I'm guessing. Like it's like we do have those kind of innate, like I'm an instructional designer, but I wouldn't like you don't want to see my stick people. I can't draw. But um like you know what looks good and what doesn't. So you just if you look at these principles over time, do you develop a better sense of how they all kind of work together as you play with them? Like would you say? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'll you kinda already kinda <laughs> answered that one a bit <laughs> for me. Yeah. See, um, okay, let me back to my uh just slides the women's principles. Okay, so here, real quick. Okay, so you have all these elements and the principles. Okay, so the principles as suggested here are guidelines to manipulate these elements and their features, and you have all of this. Mm -hmm. right? So back to your point, of course, it won't like you won't be an expert on the principles after this session because we're only talking about mainly, you know, using this to manipulate the color and font, but you right. can also manipulate all of this. Although color and the font are the most common elements in e-learning, I would say, you know, normal people do this too. Mm -hmm. But as you grow your knowledge and see more examples, you will see this principle manip manipulating other, you know, this four and more and a lot of others, you know, in e-learning. So it definitely, you should try, yeah, try and error. And also you should push yourself or, you know, just force yourself to check the, at least this for every time before you send anything to your students. Just mm -hmm. do a checklist for yourself and make sure you check them. Because let's be honest, you check grammar, you check the information flow, right? Right, yeah. But what about this? Like you have to, you know, from this point in your life, you have to start considering this at least. Okay. Yeah, no, it's a good point because I don't like. I mean, I am a, I'm a, I'm a grammar person. Like, I will check that. Until, <laughs> but like, I don't give a second thought to my visuals or like even how my paragraphs are laid out, especially when I'm doing stuff online. No, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. The other one uh, question I had was, um, would you recommend student feedback on visuals for your course evaluations? Like, because I I don't see that in course mm -hmm. evaluations. Yeah. I'm wondering if that would be like a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the point here is, there is a quote. <laughs> I'm not sure the, per the person who said this quote, but mm -hmm. good design is invisible design. Mm -hmm. You see my point? Good design is invisible design, which mm -hmm. means if there is a problem in your design that made an impact, a negative impact on the reading of students, then they will say something. <laughs> like in your experience, they have pointed it out then? Or? Yeah, I have students sending me pictures uh, they go to different, they go to other classes, and they saw really bad design. They snap pictures and send it to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding. Yeah, and I got a lot of those pictures. So yeah, I, you, of course, you know, as a responsible instructor, you can put that in the evaluation, you know, questions or something. But um, yeah, I will always go back to my point. If your design is good, it is invisible. Mm -hmm. Students navigate your document without any troubles, without any stop, if they right. notice something, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point, I like that. Thank you. Thank you. I have one question. Um, you and I have already connected on, on a love of layout. I need to know what font you've been using. It's gorgeous. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, so this one, um, okay, back to our point. Uh, where, 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 where. Uh, uh. Yeah, I have too many slides. Okay, so yeah, I would say anything sans serif, the, the ones without the tails, it's okay for the smaller text. For the big ones, like the titles, it's okay for the right one. So anything here without the tails for a digital environment, I would recommend. And for mine, so this one is, I think is a default, one of the default font of Mac, uh, Tahoma. <laughs> wow, I wouldn't have guessed to home with that. Very nice. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, I have a question, Ming. Uh, yeah. This is really good. Uh, oh, thank you. But to me, this requires quite a lot of uh, artistic, artistic feelings, <laughs> which uh, is something that um, you're born with. So. I'm wondering, when, but when I look at the design, I, I can see the, the contrast in how these visual elements create in giving us the contrast. It's very good. But for beginners like me, what, 
uh, how can I start from scratch? Or what kind of tool you use in helping you, or templates you use to help you to, to facilitate your design? OK, Harry, thank you for you know, saying the artistic ability. But it doesn't need it. It is not needed for beginners. You know, just to start from carp. <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, just start from carp. Contrast, alignment, repetition, proximity, contrast of colors, contrast of font, alignment of text, alignment of images, repetition of font, repetition of colors, proximity between images and the text. Start from this four. And then when you are familiar, when you are comfortable with applying this to different formats of learning content, for example, all of this for in Word documents, in PowerPoint slides, in learning management systems as mentioned by Dr. Ames, you know, in Canvas pages. But start from this for in various media, working with very you know different media format and the devices. From there, you will find problems in the middle of applying them and then conduct your own study, which also go back to my point here. There are a lot of it going on. You are not going to, you know, learn everything here today or feel confident enough, like, oh, okay, I'm an expert in CARP. No, I'm, going, I'm just doing this right now, which is why I ask you to start from CARP and then start from there to learn more on yourself and then find more problems on yourself. Is that okay? Sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? We, we, uh, we have a, a new class of medical students here who just started learning online two weeks ago. And last week, I, I taught them, uh, well, they had, they had a, an online session in PowerPoint. And I, I really just kind of stressed, like, keep it simple, you know, like, I'm just you know, almost like just keep a white background, black text, but, you yeah. know, it, but that was my advice to like new people, you know, new, new, uh, uh, not novices with PowerPoint, but, um, and, and they did do that, but you know, it's, it's a, it's a strange balance, you know, between like just staying conservative, but also adding these, these sort of touches that will draw attention to things, you know, and like, what you know about color or arrows or like you're saying contrast to those cart principles, you know, which, you know, I think those kind of things can, can take a little while, but they can be taught. I, I, I believe that's true. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Ames. See, like right now, I like, I really like your idea, you know, to start from simple, like even in my slides, in my up here, you know, for someone who's not very familiar with the PowerPoint uh, presentation will say like, oh my gosh, me, your slides are flashy or, you know, very fancy, but actually it's black, you know, it's white background. It's dark text and nothing else. It's just aligning things and making contrast between the title and the you know, and the main tags, that's it. It's carp. It's nothing else fancy. It's all white background, right? So, yeah, I do like that point. And, uh, you know, for UGHE, we have our web website, and we can tell a story from here because you see a lot of what? A lot of reds. You see a lot of red, you see a lot of white, and you see gold. So you can use gold, red, and white as a color palette for your course offered at UGHE. Uh, but do pay attention because the red is very, you know, very hard on the eyes. Do use what, uh, you call, uh, the red as an accent color just for some warning or some, you know, information like that. You can use gold also as, you know, accent color. And you can use white as a background and just choose a black test with the help of red and gold to bring attention, to make contrast. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Hello, Ming. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for this very amazing uh, presentation. I really learned a lot from this principle of design. And uh, I want to ask you, are you going to share uh, the record of this uh, lecture uh, to, with us? D Dr. Ames, is that a question for you? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have recording um, on my end, but I, I believe Dr. Ames has been recording this session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's recorded. Being recorded. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'll ask Dr. Ames to share the recording with me. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to um, have the slides or have a recording of the presentation, this is my email. M-I-N-G, my name, Ming, G-B-T, L-V-T dot E-D-U. G-B-T is, um, is Chinese. It means broadcasting station because I used to work as a radio host at my university back in China. So M-I-N-G, G-B-T. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ming. Well, I, I would just like to say thank you very much, Ming. Um, I, 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 I love this topic. I think, you know, visual literacy is one of my favorite parts of instructional design. You know, I, I think it's just kind of infinitely fascinating, you know, thinking about all the, the different pieces that you can sort of, you know, play with and, and you know, come up with, with you know, new ideas. So I really, um, you know, enjoy this a lot. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to share this topic with um, everyone here. Thank you. Thank you, Ming. It was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you.